This is Derek and welcome to The Verbal Process. I'm really excited to have James Cortides with me all the way from Florida and I'm recording in California. Hi James, how are you doing? Hey Derek, doing well man. Thanks for having me in these, uh, these interesting times we're in. Appreciate it. Yeah, interesting times indeed. Um, glad it works out that we can come together virtually through the technologies of Zoom. Uh, so really I invited you James to join the channel today to, to help sort out how Christianity should understand order and chaos and how to understand Christ as the eternal Tao. Uh, but first, I'd like to get to know you a little bit more. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about your background? Um, sure. I um, kind of start quickly at the beginning. I'm a first-generation Greek immigrant. My folks moved here from northern Greece in 1980. Um, they're from a village that's about two hours north of uh, uh, Mount Athos in, uh, in Kalkidiki. So um, it's a little village in Thessaloniki, outside of Thessaloniki, which is a northern city. Um, they moved here in the early 1980s. I was born in 1981. Um, my parents were in the restaurant business, you know, go figure, Greek cliche. Mm -hmm. um, they worked in the restaurant business, and um, my grandparents raised me uh, when I was young. Went to the Greek Orthodox Church there uh, as I was a kid with my aunt, really, and my, my uh, cousins. Um, it, was in, it was really, you know, at that point, kind of going through the motions and never really understood what I was looking at or I was never really put in a context. It's just something that, you know, we had to fast and I was kind of annoying. And, uh, you know, my, my cousins, we'd all fight in the back of the car on the way to church. Um, so uh, that was till about I was 12 or 13 years old then we stopped going my parents had a divorce when I was about 14 which was a crisis in the family because you know a Greek traditional family there's really divorce is not uh, is frowned upon that was a major crisis for me um, in high school I um, you know played some sports but then I started getting into the drinking and really hard partying scene mm. um, and starting getting into some trouble um, which was, uh, of course, uh, uh, an expression of chaos in my life, which led me to um, having to do something to get out of trouble, where I uh, applied to college, and I went to uh, University of Florida. I got in there, which was really a way to get me off of probation that I was on with, uh, with the judge, uh, and there's where I, um, I found philosophy. Uh, I started a political science degree I took a political philosophy course, which um, really massively changed my life. I really got interested in um, political philosophy and then um, German idealism, you know, Heidegger, um, Kant. Um, that really uh, piqued my interest, my, opened my intellectual curiosity, and I started getting into critical theory, uh, which was really the only option that you had in terms of high-level philosophy, uh, postmodernism. Uh, you know, critiquing metaphysics, critiquing, um, you know, Western society, you know, all that fun stuff that you that you you're kind of doing the universities these days, um, which, um, you know, I graduated, I met my wife. Um, and then I got into a career um, in the healthcare sales and, and consulting. Um, and, you know, I started, was studying a lot more philosophy after college than even I did before uh, I finished. And um, got into integral theory. I don't know if you're familiar with Ken Wilber. Um, he is a, a philosopher who uh, has this idea of integrating um, all of the world's religions and science into kind of a higher framework. Hmm. Uh, when she introduced me to Eastern, Eastern philosophies, uh, meditation, things of that nature. Um, and then more recently, 2014, my son was born, uh, which uh, had that plus, you know, trying to work through and anxieties that I've had in my entire life, issues with addiction from, you know, my previous partying days. I found um, Qigong through going to an acupuncturist. Um, and it was, it, I can remember the date, October 2015, I had an awakening, which um, I was able to beat most of my addiction, was introdu introduced to the concept and the understanding of Qi, which means energy. Um, I got into meditation, uh, I got into energy work, um, breath work, uh, which had a tremendous effect on me personally and my life. Um, like we were talking about earlier, I, I quit a very well-paying job against the advice of all my family and my wife 
uh, and I started a business um, meditation and energy work, Qigong business, where I thought to myself, you know, this helped me so much in my life. People are going to love it. Um, not a great idea in terms of a business yeah. um, <laughs> at, at all. Uh, but, you know, it, at the same time, around 2016, I found Jordan Peterson, um, you know, like a, lot, like a lot of folks did. Uh, I watched literally every one of his videos. Um, and it was his biblical series lecture, uh, which I watched literally every single one of them, a couple of them twice, mm-hmm. that reoriented me back towards um, the Bible, Christianity. Um, I felt like, you know what, I, um, my family goes back centuries from Greece, right? I feel like I was the reason in my generation that we were cut off from our Christianity, cut off from our Greek Orthodox roots. Um, so finding Jordan Peterson, finding Jonathan Pajau and the language and intuition of symbolism um, reoriented me back towards Orthodox Christianity. I found the Church Fathers, um, which I uh, have been studying intensely. I started reading scripture a, a lot more about a year ago, uh, which um, kind of led, led, you know, now I'm, I'm trying to understand things like the meaning crisis that a lot of people are talking about, mm-hmm. the ideas of how our sense making. Um, you know, architecture has been has been destroyed essentially, and how can we make sense of the world? How can we use Christianity, which uh, is dismissed a lot of times as as uh, superstition, um, but to me it seems like it's the actual anchor of of uh, being of reality. Um, how can we use these ideas um, to come back to a better understanding of ourself and our place in the world? Essentially, and that's where I'm at. <laughs> Pretty wow. much there. So. Yeah. yeah, so uh, you bring up Jordan Peterson in, in part of your, your, your journey, and I'm just wondering mm-hmm. how you appropriated, how he integrated the order and chaos into the reading of the biblical series, especially the Genesis stories, and he seemed to lean on that heavily, uh, mm-hmm. and he also included it in several chapters of his book, 12 Rules for Life, and so just having your background with the chi, the 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 Tao, the, the, the energy work that you've done. I'm just wondering, how did you respond to that? And how did, like, did you hear that and say, oh my goodness, like, he is totally off, or, you know, maybe he's just a, a little bit off, or maybe it was spot on, I don't know. How, how did that settle with you? Yeah, um, it, it was really the latter with me. It was more of, uh, you know, it was an intuition that, wow, this guy is onto something. Um, and I was coming from a place of studying Taoism, which is uh, essentially uh, the yin yang symbol, right? Which is the um, um, which is the interplay of chaos and order, right? So um, mm-hmm. chaos and order both inter- interplay with each other in order for reality to manifest itself. Um, and the way that he was talking about how you know we bring about order through chaos, right? Chaos is not just uh, a bad thing. It's the potential out of which we can uh, manifest order in both our lives and in the world. Um, so he was really talking about this and it kind of, it meshed a lot with what I was um, studying and experiencing in Taoism. Um, and then the understanding of how, you know, Jesus Christ was the, the, you know, the kind of confluences, the manifestation of, of ultimate order uh, in chaos and him being able, being able to articulate the understandings of, of Genesis, the Bible, but specifically Genesis as the, um, the play of creation manifesting itself through the interplay of heaven and earth, right? You can think of heaven as the ordering principle. You can think of earth as the, uh, the potential or chaotic principle. Um, and as man being the mediator between the two, um, mediates the logos, the truth, the way, by appropriately mediating heaven and earth, chaos and order, and weaving it into a functional life, uh, which is a, a persona or a person. Um, so I think of as, as logos on the personal sense as a appropriately, appropriately mediating heaven and earth uh, in life, essentially. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I, it resonated a lot with Jordan. I still do. And um, he brought me to uh, the Pajau brothers and language of creation and, and the symbol, symbolic intuition symbolic framework that to me is just adding to what Jordan Peterson was doing. Mm -hmm. So 
I wanted to uh, get back to what you said about the, the language of creation and the, the heavenly and the earthly principles or the orderly or the chaotic. And so I have the physical copy. I don't know if you can see it. My webcam is kind of being a little bit glary today. Mm -hmm. So you've talked about the first pair or the first dyad of the, what Pajot, in this case, uh, Matthew Pajot brings out in his book of the dentrocentric or the, the worldview that was present during the writings of the Bible. We've gone away from that in several different types of modern worldviews. I mean, you touched upon postmodernism and critical theory and a lot of other ways of looking at the world as more materialistic. But here he introduces heaven and earth, right? So the, the heavenly aspects would be uh, the invisible, the yet meaningful, consider it like the theories or the information that informs earth and earth would be the raw potentiality, the materials that embody the, the heavenly meaning and attributes. So the other thing that Peugeot writes in his book is also time and space. And so with time, right, that would be like the cyclical and the transformative properties of the, the cosmos. But then space is more of like the, the orderly, the, the work, the things that build, the things that multiply a, a, from a, a particular pattern. So we have heaven and earth and we have time and space. And I'm just wondering, is the Taoist order and chaos, is that something that's applicable to both or maybe just one pair and not the other? How do you see that fitting? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, I was actually thinking about if you can map on uh, time as being reflective of chaos and space being reflective of order. And I think there's some coherence there if, if they don't match kind of 100% appropriately. But the, the kind of the interesting part in, in Taoism is you want to be on, and Jordan Peterson talks about this, you want to be on that line, that thin line between order and chaos. If you have, if you have too much chaos, nothing can get accomplished. Everything is due too organized. If you have too much order, then you are too rigid and you don't have any ability to create. So the process of creation itself is this following this thin line between order and chaos um, and, and mediating between heaven and earth. And, um, and I don't know, I think, you know, functioning it comfortably, appropriately between time and space Right, being able to uh, kind of take on the, uh, the 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 chaos of life, the, the the change and the difference of time, right, while trying to keep a center, while trying to hold the space of uh, you know of order. So I see them as as uh, very resonant with 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 Taoism and how they both you know kind of uh, underpin, undergird this fundamental pattern of of being, this fundamental pattern of reality which is this central figure uh, that is mediating between heaven and earth, um, which is the Tao, right? The Tao is, is, is following the way. So the Tao can be thought of as the truth, the way, uh, the logos. It's not, can't be spoken of. They call it the wordless word um, in, in, um, in Taoism. Um, and the book that um, I've been reading, Christ the Eternal Tao, uh, really talks about how the pre the ancients uh, the pre Socratics Heraclitus um, Lao Tzu who was kind of the originator of Taoism um, Native Americans ancient Native Americans and of course the the pre Christian Hebrews right they all intuited the Tao they all intuited the logos they mm -hmm. saw it in nature they saw it in stilling the mind they saw it in the way a flower grows they saw it in you know, uh, in all of these ways and manifestations in the world um, that were true, right? And then it, the Logos was made manifest, actually became flesh in the world, manifested himself in, in Jesus Christ, um, which is, uh, I mean, it's hard to wrap your mind around that, that happening. Um, and um, it gave people uh, something to concretely look at and to follow and to and to attach themselves towards and to you know uh, work towards that will lead them towards their truth to their personal truth towards you know existential truth 
if you follow the words and the life of Jesus Christ, your life will unfold in such a way that you will bring order out of chaos. You will be able to um, uh, work through the difficulties in life. Uh, it's not going to be easy. It, nothing's, it, you know, life isn't easy, but it's, it's, a, it's a compass that you can follow um, both individually, but also as a family and as a collective. Um, if you follow the ideas and the words of Jesus Christ, you know, don't lie, uh, don't cheat, don't steal, you know, don't have thoughts of adultery. It's not that you know, you're going to get punished by some retribu retribution by God later on. It's your life will not unfold in a way that you will be bringing joy and order to your life and others' life. So it's, it's really a, it's, it's, it's a, it's hard to wrap your head around how, you know, profound that is, um, that manifestation of, of God in this world. I mean, if you really, if you really believe that that happened, then you have to deal with it, that that happened, you know, and that's, uh, that's kind of where I'm at now trying to not understand it, but, um, incorporate it into my life. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's mind boggling, you know. Now in, in what you're describing, is it something that, like, how would you uh, describe sin in what you just described as the mediation or that thin line that's between the time and space or chaos and order, heaven and earth? Sure. Um, and this is where there's some more resonances with, with uh, the Taoists, right? So the Taoists have this concept called Ming, M-I-N-G, which is, can be interpreted as destiny, right? So you can think of as your destiny being uh, the truth of your life, which we think of as a straight line. So you have your birth, your origin, and your death, your end, right? That straight line is your destiny, or I would, I would say it's your logos, it's your truth, right? So life is not a straight line. So as you're moving through time towards your end, you're moving um, up and down the line towards the way, towards the Tao, towards your main, towards your destiny. And I was thinking about it as, as you're moving away, right, to sin, uh, the, the Greek terminology for sin is amartia, uh, um, and it comes from archery, which means to miss the mark. So I think it fits really well here. If the, the straight line is the mark, the mark is the end of your life, uh, right? So to miss the mark is to be not aiming appropriately. So as you're sinning, as you're missing the mark, you're moving away from your purpose, right? Um, and then to repent, metanoia, right, is to do an about face, is to turn towards God. So as you're moving off your mark, you're doing, you're repenting, and then you're moving, you're following, you know, the low guy as, you know, uh, St. Maximus, the confessor talks about the low guy, which is the uh, individual particulars that the qualities that make up the logos. So they are these truths in life that you can follow back as you've missed your path. And I would see them in scripture. Reading scripture is a way to, you know, move back towards the logos, move back towards your, your Ming back towards your destiny. So I see the, the interplay of sin, repentance, and then using the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit using you to move back towards a life following Jesus. Uh, and it happens throughout your life. And when I was talking about my upbringing earlier, it happens through the interplay of chaos and order, right? So there's an event that happens in your life. In my case, uh, it was the divorce of my parents, which was a crisis, which brought chaos into my life. Um, I had a lot of difficulties uh, in school. I got involved in the wrong crowd, but that was the potential, right, for a higher level of order to come into being, which wouldn't have been possible without that chaos, right? Mm -hmm. So crisis happens, you start sinning, you're off the mark, and then by the grace of God, you repent, you know, and your life turns around, and you can incorporate all of the difficulties and you can, you know, um, you know, have a higher, under, better understanding of yourself in the world by overcoming the chaos that was in your life, which you turn it into order, right? And again, the, 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 the purpose is to be on that thin line. That thin line is between chaos and order. And for time, your life, well, my life was orderly again, and then boom, something else happens, um, you know, and, and, that crisis and integrating the crisis and integrating the chaos into order is something that everybody does, I think, intuitively. Um, but again, like we were talking about, you know, you know, the logos became flesh. The truth was made manifest for you to follow. So in a life of chaos, which we are all seeing more and more of, 
there is a compass, there is a way to follow, um, follow Jesus in a way that will have you integrating, incorporating chaos into life in the best way possible. And again, not just for you. If you are living a life following Jesus, you know, uh, not dogmatically, like, you know, you're following his work to the best of your ability, your family will see that. Your, the people in your community will see that. They will be attracted to that. Um, and, and not in a sense, some egoistic or, or uh, you know, um, self-exaltation way. They will see that your life is, is ordering itself appropriately. Um, they will see that the relationships that you've had with your family um, are starting to mend. They will see that you, the way that you treat your kids, right, the way that you are with your kids, they will just intuit. They're like, you know what, I, you know, you were, you were, you know, you will be able to, you know, kind of make yourself a better person, and that spreads towards, spreads out into your community, um, you know. And it's not really an intellectual thing. It's more of, uh, uh, you know, I think this is the solution in terms of the meaning crisis and in terms of the the crazy um, misinformed world that we're in is, is to uh, find these eternal truths that are there for us to find. Um, so yeah, I, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating times that we're in. I definitely I hope Indeed. that makes sense. Yeah. So are you a father yourself? Uh, yes. Yes. I have a, uh, I have a five-year-old boy. Uh, I have a two-year-old girl and I have a third one on the way. Um, and again, it was the rupture of my son being born, which was in a sense, a chaos in my life it was a wonderful thing, but it, it, that opened my mind up and it made me want to find a way to be a better person. And the relationship with him and with my wife became paramount. Um, and, uh, it, that was a huge, uh, one of those events that happen in life, right. That turn you towards order that turn you towards the truth of your being, you know, childbirth mm -hmm. is one of the most amazing things. And it's, uh, it's a powerful tool to uh, help you on your path. At least it was for me. Um, I don't know, you know, what your experience was, but it's just power for sure. Yeah. So I don't have the five-year-old, but I do have the two-year-old and one on the way. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yeah it, I can definitely relate because it felt like um, one of those moments where you kind of like have a heavenly perspective or you're outside of time and space. Mm -hmm. So you know, all of a sudden, instead of just thinking about what's most immediately in front of you, be it, you know, gratification, uh, whatever your, your addictions or pleasures or even your ambitions, mm -hmm. you know, it has such a narrow focus. And in that moment when uh, my daughter was born uh, about two years ago, it was that moment where all of a sudden I could think generationally, I could think beyond, mm -hmm. you know, just me or this immediate life. But all of a sudden, I started changing my actions based on the, the say, the heavenly information of uh, multi generational. You know, I'm starting to do things instead of just like, oh, what's the reward I can get soon? It's more of like, yeah, what will my grandkids or great grandkids, even after I'm long gone, you know, yeah. what will this thing that I'm a, a part of, how would that uh, change their life? Yeah, so, um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you, you're participating and you're participating in the process of creation. You're literally mediating, creating another life with, uh, you know, you're integrating the masculine and the feminine, right? Your wife and yourself brought uh -huh. a being into creation, you know, literally just mediated heaven and earth, you know, chaos and order, the feminine, and the masculine, and created a being. I mean, it's the process of creation. That's what I think is, is so profound about it and why it has this effect on, uh, on people's lives. You know, it's, it's embodying these stories that we, that we read. You're actually participating in it. It's like, oh, okay, this is real. This isn't some philosophy. This is real. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with the realness of fatherhood. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'd have to say that Jordan Peterson was pretty helpful for me in that respect where it was kind of like a call to arms or, you know, seize the moment kind of kind of time for me because my wife was pregnant and I was at uh, school at University of Davis when I came across uh, uh, the biblical series especially and just that message really resonated with me and kind of drew out the, the manhood or the fatherhood from me in, in really important ways. Yes. Yeah. And then, so uh, James, uh, you know, the masculine is, is under attack, um, you know, and it's not, 
you know, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's a precarious time that, that we're living in. Um, just quickly, in your background, where, were you, are you Pentecost? Where did you come from, from the kind of Christian background that uh, you found Peterson? Like, what was your path towards finding yeah. his work? Yeah, so uh, I think the best way to say it would be that my, I grew up in my grandpa's church, and it was not a nominational, but the best way to describe it would be something like Assemblies of God, for mm-hmm. if you're familiar with that. And then uh, pretty similar to yours, actually, you know, high school uh, would go to church hungover at times and got to the point where I was just tired of feeling bad about it and uh, was really uh, under the, the oppression or the addiction of what my friends thought about me and wanting to please them. So that led me to all different sorts of things and perhaps we can <laughs> get into the full response of my background later. But uh, th- during the time of Peterson though, I was definitely, uh, back at it i was on the way of christ and Mm -hmm. wholeheartedly committed but during that time i was confronted with the similar things that you were probably confronted with at university with postmodernism, critical theory a materialist worldview and a real bashing of christianity uh you know i i had a degree a program that i was going through called community development and uh can't say i learned a whole lot about either community or development, and it was more so just a, a frontage for some other political agendas uh, for the most part. I mean, there's a few classes that were very helpful, and I use a lot of the things I learned today, but by and large, I was really disappointed that we didn't actually, you know, learn how to start a nonprofit or anything like that. It was definitely more politically driven, and that was challenging a lot of the, the views that I had known, not just with growing up with my grandpa's church, but also with what I was uh, experiencing in the, the new circles or this new uh, reconnection with Christ that I had mm-hmm. experienced a few years prior. So when Jordan Peterson came onto the scene for me, it was more of a, uh, a relief because it was like, oh my gosh, I'm not, like, I was just intuiting all these things up until that point, but then he actually named it. He actually mm-hmm. said, like, here, these are the tenets. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been experiencing that, but I'm like, I don't want to get into it. I, I don't want to like commit to it, but I feel bad because everybody else around me is. And so he really helped uh, provide a vocabulary for the landscape and what was going on at the time at university in my life. And I was already reading the Bible a lot. And, and, but something that he did was he was able to, to touch on different domains, whether it was order or chaos or whether Peterson was drawing from the Genesis stories or his psychoanalytic profession or, you know, just the, the philosophy that he was studying at the time or his Maps of Meaning book that he wrote. So it was like he was drawing from all these different domains into one place and it just seemed to, to have a cohesion to it. It made for a very, a very powerful message. And I, I came across a, a reading that I want to share with you and really, uh, perhaps it's in the spirit of that message that we're having a conversation today, James. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you, if you would uh, just uh, allow me to read maybe a, a couple paragraphs from a book. Is that all right? Sure, of course. Okay. Did you have any uh, comments or, or questions up to this point before I <laughs> launch into um, something else? No, I just I wanted to just comment on Jordan's situation right now. Um, you know, I'm praying for for him and uh you know he's he has a you know rupture of chaos in his life that he's uh, once he overcomes you know and he manifests that uh and he in- integrates that chaos into order i cannot wait to see what he's going to bring to the table um you know when when he gets over his situation now so i'm looking forward to to seeing him back um you know a- a- as the new jordan in a sense you know you yeah, go through the, his dark the the dark night of the soul you know you go through the dark night of your soul and it seems like he had a really, and he's going through a really tough time, which according to him, and, and I think it's true, is the potential for really something great to come. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, I'm, I'm you know, happy to listen to what you got. Yeah. Hey, man, he has to come back and do Exodus, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm holding out for. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I want to read from a book called The Story of Christianity. It's by David Bentley Hart, and uh, he took on the, the not-so-insignificant task of 
consolidating all of the 2,000 years of Christian history into 343 page book. So, <laughs> uh, but he did it in at least a satisfactory way to where he published it. So, so in this particular section, he's talking about the Far East. Here we go. And the Jesuit missions in China, that of the Catholic Church, began in 1582, were originally models of peaceful intellectual and cultural exchange, in large part because the most remarkable of the missionaries to China, Matteo Ricci and Michel Ruggieri, wished to aid in the creation of genuinely Chinese Christianity in harmony with natives for native forms of piety and philosophy, and as untainted by Europeanism as possible. Ricci was especially drawn to Confucianism, which was the dominant tradition among the rich and educated, through which he believed divine truth had made itself known to the Chinese from ancient times. Ruggieri, by contrast, was drawn to Taoism, which flourished more among persons of lower estate, and believed that it was principally under the form of the Tao that a knowledge of God's eternal logos had entered China. This difference occasionally caused tension between the two men's converts, but both Ricci and Ruggieri passionately believed in the presence of a primordial revelation in Chinese tradition, and that the philosophical and spiritual riches of that tradition might one day, as had once happened with the traditions of Greece and Rome, be assumed into a new Christian cultural synthesis. He had, which Ricci had a regard for indigenous rights as, you know, what he would say perfectly admirable expressions of civilized reverence and, and entirely that were entirely compatible with Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, for example, offerings made in, in honor of the emperor, their ancestors, or Confucius, uh, but also use of Chinese names like Shang-Ti for God and Tian for heaven, and even the use of traditional uh, temple signs like how they would have over the, the threshold reverence for heaven. And so Ricci didn't find a problem with any of this because they were within the expression of Christianity. But then the Pope came and, and uh, didn't care for that, shut it down, and then the emperor of China found out and, and uh, retaliated and really had not so many kind words for the uh, Occidental religions. And that was what began the shutdown uh, from China, and they kicked China, or the Chinese expression of Christianity out and Christianity altogether. And China was underground ever since the 16th century. So I was wondering at this point of the reading of this book, okay, so what were some of these things? Like what are some other uh, cultural synthesis that we've had and really intrigued by what he said about the, the recognition of God's eternal logos and how it was intuited in China, and that they could see that there was uh, that there was truth that was expressed. You know, of course, they had different names for it. They had a different way of describing it, but at the core, it was describing the logos or the word of God. So at this point, I'm like, "Wow, man, this is awesome!" And then I came across uh, some of the conversations that you were involved with in the symbolic world. Uh, in the Zombie Apocalypse Facebook group and saw that you had some commentary on the Tao and then I followed you over to your YouTube channel and saw that you were reading this book, Christ, the Eternal Tao. And I'm about halfway through the videos that you've posted so far and you're posting about what, 15 to, to 20 minute increments about Christ, the Eternal Tao with a couple little commentaries here and there throughout your reading. And it just seemed to really be the next step in my learning. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to you and uh, see what your comments on the Chinese history that David Bentley Hart brings up, but then also uh, express what's going on in this book, Christ the Eternal Tao. Sure. Yeah, no, that's, uh, we're kind of very at a similar place. Um, kind of right now and in, in are wrestling with, with these ideas. And uh, the book, uh, Christ the Eternal Tao, was really a pivot point for me because it, it, um, it situated my understanding of, you know, I studied Chinese medicine and Taoism, um, and it, it really situated it and put it in a context of 
it's the truth. It's, it's truth. There's truth in, in Taoism, right? Um, there's truth in their conceptions and their intuitions and their understandings. It might not be the ultimate truth, but there are intuitions of the logos that are being manifested by, um, you know, these great sages of ancient China. Um, and the book is inspired and written about Father Seraphim Rose's experience with um, going through uh, this process of he was studying uh, Chinese uh, culture, Chinese philosophy, and Taoism uh, when he was uh, younger under the uh, tutelage of Alan Watts. I don't know if you know who Alan Watts is, but he, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, I was heavily into Alan Watts myself. I uh, still okay. appreciate him a lot. Um, and he actually studied under Alan Watts for a while, but then found an actual um, uh, legitimate transmitter of the Chinese tradition in a um, scholar, his name is Ji Ming Shen. Uh, uh, he was the one that he studied under in China for many, many years, 20 plus years, he studied their, their history and their philosophy and their spirituality before he came back to, or he came to orthodoxy um, and his transition from you know, the, the Chinese uh, uh, ethics, the Chinese situation to orthodoxy was, well, it hit me like a, like a ton of bricks. Like it was something that just was profound and his ability to talk about and to put into words the, how, you know, the resonances between the ideas of, you know, heaven and earth and chaos and order and, and the, uh, you know, a lot of the ideas that the, the ancient Chinese were putting forth they are not like it, he talks about the book about um, it's not about synchronizing. It's not saying that all religions are equal. You know, that's not where he's, where he's coming at. Uh, so he's working between, between, you know, the idea of saying that all religions are equal and, and, you know, or that saying there's one particular fundamentalist way to look at religion, both of those he's trying to stay away from. Um, but kind of his idea of, of the Tao and how it manifested itself, uh, how the logos, the truth, like the quote that you quoted there, how does God's truth, there is the eternal truth is manifested in different ways in different cultures. Um, and, uh, you know, he talks about how the pagans even intuited uh, the truth in the world. The Hebrews intuited and, and, and spoke about the truth in the world. And in and, and Chinese medicine and Taoism, uh, they have this, uh, these concepts called the three treasures. Um, they're called, uh, and this is what we work with when you do Qigong, when you do energy work, right? You work with the Shen, which is the spirit, uh, the Qi, which is the, the energy or the spirit, uh, uh, yeah, the energy and the Jing, which is the physical manifestation. So uh, reality being is manifested in this tripartite structure, right? You have heaven, you have uh, earth and then humanity. It maps on perfectly to Ji, uh, Jing, Jing, which is a physical manifestation, Qi, which is the soul manifestation, and Shen, which is the, the spiritual manifestation. And um, it, working with these three ideas, these three concepts, when you're doing energy work, you are working and you're doing movements, you're doing meditations and visualizations, and you're working with the meridians in the human body, which are you know, kind of the energy circuits that run through our body. Uh, there are blocks in these different energy circuits and those blocks manifest themselves as disease in the body over time. Um, so if you had a traumatic event that happened as a child, that event is stored in the body energetically. And if it is not processed over time, that energy that's stored in the body manifests itself as either cancer or some other type of disease or mental illness. Um, so working with uh, qi, qigong, ma manifesting and, and cultivating, uh, cultivating the Holy Spirit from a Chinese uh, Taoist perspective, you're cultivating this energy that works to purify the spirit, to get rid of um, blockages, to get rid of you know um, old ideas, old conceptions, which again are stored in the body, which you clear your energy pathways, you clear your meridians, which is purifies your heart and brings you closer to God. That, you know, that's the, that's the conception that is, is made in, in the, from the Chinese medicine perspective, right? So there's a lot of, you know, resonances. And something that drew me to that is there's actually physical, practical exercises you can do to work with your body. Your body's a microcosm of the macrocosm, right? So 
why wouldn't there be ways to work with your body? And then Qigong, they're soft, slow, intentional movements incorporated with meditation that when you do, it, it, it helps to, um, to shed layers of ego, to shed layers of, of uh, uh, layers that you've added over time um, and to get closer to the true spirit, which is in the heart. Um, and that, that's another thing that the church fathers talk about um, of how, you know, the secret place where you go to pray is the heart. But when you try to go to that place, that place to pray, your mind attacks you, you know, your mind, you know, you try to quiet your mind to pray, you know, the Jesus prayer, the noetic prayer, which is something that uh, is very, you know, very attractive to me. When you try to do that, you I can't because you're thinking about today or tomorrow, what this person did to me. So you can do these practices, these physical practices in order to um, shed away layers of uh, what they call the acquired mind, which if you think of when you're born, according to the, the Chinese medicine, the Taoist perspective, you are pure consciousness, right? So you think of you're the center of pure consciousness. And over time, through experiences, you add layers, like a circle, adding layers and layers and layers. So the pure consciousness, your spirit, is never leaves you. It never goes away. But it's covered over by layers of ego. Um, and working with different movements in the, the Chinese medicine perspective, it breaks, sheds away layer after layer after layer after layer so you can connect the heart to the mind um, and to make that connection um, and the church fathers talk about that as well about that the logos there's the cognitive function of the logos that we're all addicted to like you know um, just cognitive function which is the expression of your intellect but we do it in a way where it's not connected with the heart right so we're very logical we're very critical we're very uh, calculating, right? Which is uh, something that is uh, gifted to us by God. But that is just the, the lower level, lower functioning of the soul, right? The higher functioning, the higher level is connecting the heart uh, and the mind and manifesting the logos in a way that it's, uh, it's done um, and it, as close as you can get it the way it was before the fall, right? There's a way that being was for man before the fall and after the fall, we fell into pride, you know, sin and self-love, but we still have access to that through prayer, through repentance, through following the scripture and in, in, in Christianity, through doing the different movements and works in, in, uh, in Chinese medicine. Um, but the most profound example of this is Jesus Christ and following uh, the way, the truth, uh, and, and the manifestation of the truth in the world. So sorry about that. It's my dog. Um, hey, so yeah, yeah. So um, you know, he he talks a lot about um, these ideas in the book, um, but it really drives it home of what it means um, to uh, to find this truth in in the way it was brought to us in the world through Jesus. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of rambling there, but <laughs> no, that's that's quite helpful. And what an interesting background to go from, you know, Alan Watts to a, a a very wise and respected teacher in the East, and then end up in East Christianity, you know, through orthodoxy. Sure. That's quite sure, a journey. Sure. And you know, it, it reminds me of a book that I read that ended up being absolutely pivotal in my returning to Christ. It was called Knowing Jesus and Buddha as Brothers. Mm -hmm. um, and so the book I found, and it was while I was traveling, it was when I was uh, really soaking up everything I could learn. And I was traveling with a, a person that was involved with Vedanta, which is uh, very much into trying to find the overlapping patterns of all religions. And, mm -hmm. but I read this book and it was not written by a Christian. It was written by a Buddhist and a very respected monk who had an ashram in France. And as I was reading it, it was saying things like, uh, what was it, mindfulness and the Holy Spirit are the same thing, but just described with different names and maybe in slightly you know, unique ways, but at the core, they're, they're serving the same function. And so I, I was reading about these things and what it was doing is it was pivoting me towards Christianity, where I was in a place where I was less than curious, but all of a sudden it's, it was one of the things that 
began to stir up that curiosity and direct my attention back towards my roots in Christianity. And I bring it up because the work that Peugeot's done, Jonathan Peugeot, in describing monsters and especially hybrids at the perimeter really has helped me understand works like perhaps the, uh, the Christ is the Eternal Tao and knowing Jesus and Buddha as, brother, as brothers, because what they are is they're not quite Christian, they're not quite Buddhist, or not quite Tao, not quite uh, Christian, but what they're doing is that they're acting as a, a, a hybrid, and which can serve as two functions. So people that are, you know, say like me, I was outside of Christianity at the time, it can be used as a gate, right? It could be used as a way to direct towards the, the space or towards the center of Christianity. And in like manner, it could be used to, as a gate out. So people that are Christians that are reading it could read this, uh, uh, one of these books and think, oh, wow, maybe something else like these other religions are really great. But still, like, it's a neutral figure in that it just acts as like a bridge or a, a portal between, in and out between Christianity or another religion. But for me, it acted as a way of bringing it back to Christianity. And I, I think of how some other Christians have responded to works such as these, uh, usually negatively. And it's usually mm -hmm. definitively good or bad or it's light or darkness, and it's either of the devil, it's of God, you know. But I look at it differently now after a lot of the things that I've learned and some of the, the similar lectures that we listened to with Peugeot and Peterson and the like. And I just think like, man, what, but, but what if I didn't read that book? Mm -hmm. You know, like, where would I be? Maybe yeah. I would have, you know, not come home. Maybe I would have kept traveling and who knows where I would have ended up or, would have believed what made you things. what made you read that book why did you choose that book like you know uh you know what where were you in your time and place that that book came in in front of you and i think that is a an activity of the holy spirit right i think that was put in front of you uh, -huh. uh as a choice as as an ability to move back towards the center i don't think it was necessarily going it had to happen but i think you made the choice to read the book and to follow the thread and I think that's how the Holy Spirit acts on us is it presents us with opportunities to move us mm -hmm. back towards the center, right? It's again, it's going from, you know, missing the mark, you know, but again, that gives you the opportunity and understanding to, to integrate and to understand the center better by incorporating, you know, the Paggio talks about incorporating the outside into the inside, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's, that's a good thing. And I think it's the Holy Spirit that acts on us. Uh, like when you just said, what if I didn't read that book? You know, uh, I, I, that, that really stood out to me um, is that there are forces, invisible forces that act on us that present us with choices because we have free will that we can move towards the center with a broader understanding or back out towards chaos, which, uh, you know, could lead to, to dissolution. So, yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that, that's what stood out to me when you said that, you know. Oh, no, that's, that's awesome and quite helpful. Yeah, so yeah. the answer is that I was in a bookstore, a coffee shop bookstore that made homemade bagels. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it was in uh, San Cristobal de las Casas in southern Mexico. And mm -hmm. uh, I really loved the coffee shop uh, because we were riding our bikes a lot and we're just burning through calories. So homemade bagels and coffee at the time was like, yeah, I was there awesome. every morning for like the week we were there. And so they had a large bookshelf that filled up pretty much an entire wall of one of the, this coffee shop. And that was the book that just, you know, how it says it came out or popped out and mm -hmm. it, it almost grabbed me in a way. And, uh, so I took it off the shelf and I read it and then I came back the next day and I read it again. And then, by the last day, I'd almost read the whole book, but I decided to buy it and and keep reading it and reread it. And it just seemed to be uh, what, or it seemed to be the opportunity that I responded to because I, I totally agree that I, I really recognize the Holy Spirit's work of that which presents opportunities. And so even if, you know, so say we're going off the mark, off the mark, but it's like opportunity A, B, C, D. Okay, next mm -hmm. day, E, F, G, you know. 
And then at finally we're like, oh, we see the light or, you know, metanoia, we, we re just renew our minds and return. And in that case, that was the moment, one of the moments that uh, I chose to obey or respond or to move forward with the opportunity that the Holy Spirit was presenting at the time. Awesome. Yeah, that's wonderful, man. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with Seraphim Rose at all? Father Spirit, Seraphim Rose, have you, um, it's got, there's a great channel that I'll share with you where um, the author reads a, lot, a few of his books. There's a book called Nihilism that he wrote. I just finished reading it from listening to the series, and it was some of the most accurate. He wrote it in the 70s, and it seems like he would have wrote it this year. He just wow. accurately describes the manifestation of nihilism and what that looks like in our culture um, and the antidote to it, that which is like, wow, this is just, it, it was profound. So he's, his insight, I think he died in 1980, but his insights coming from his background and being able to articulate the solution to the meaning crisis. I, I mean, I don't say that lightly, essentially, um, which is, which is found in, um, you know, in, in stuff that's been here for thousands of years for a reason, you know, um, so I didn't know if you're familiar with any of his other works, but yeah, I have a, uh, I have a, um, an icon of him actually, because he was so influential in bringing me back. Um, I have him there cause he's, he's, he's helped me really tremendously in so many different ways and come back to Christ and, uh, that I had to do that. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to recommend and I'll share it with you maybe, uh, after I can put it in the link. But, um, you know, a lot of what's going on now and what uh, the Pagel brothers and, and people like John Verbeke and Paul Vanderclay, and uh, maybe this could be for another video, but, you know, is what they're talking about, what is the meaning crisis? Where did it come from? And is there an antidote to it? Um, you know, I see that Verbeke and Jordan Hall are coming up with this idea of a religion without a religion, um, right. you know, and then, and then Pagel talks about the resurrection of Christianity. That uh, just like Christ died, had to die in order to be resurrected, right? Christianity as a whole, you know, had to die and is essentially dead in order to be resurrected. But we can't conceptualize what a resurrected Christianity really looks like, you know. And I think that is what for Vakey and, and, you know, the cognitive model is missing is the truth. They're missing the truth. And I think a lot, they dismiss it, you know, they, they treat it. Um, as a, you know, they don't treat it um, comprehensively or really uh, wrestle with the idea of, you know, Jesus Christ being the truth that manifested itself into the world. If you, re if you wrestle with that idea, um, you know, it, it will profoundly affect you. Um, you know, so I think that, that, I think that's a tension here that, you know, uh, I'm interested in and, you know, looking at different conversations and, different narratives that are that are coming to a head here and listening to your story is very similar to my story what brought us back you know towards the center is that something that we can do collectively what happens if we don't do that collectively what happens to our children as they're growing up what kind of world are they going to be living in mm -hmm. you know these are some things that that you know that pop out to me as as the the consequences of you know um, what's going on right now so um Maybe we can do that for another video, but it's, it's definitely, definitely interesting times um, right now. Yeah. Nor is it entirely unique. You know, mm -hmm. as you see, as time is cyclical, it's like we've, we've done a few laps, you know, <laughs> uh, as far as the unfolding of this human story. And I, yeah, as you describe uh, Sarah from Rose, it's like, wow, that could have been a, a follow up to maybe. Uh, antidote to chaos 12 rules for life you know and mm -hmm. how peterson was really um responding strongly to nihilism and really wrestling himself with how to respond correctly to it because i mean it hey it's it, something that can challenge you to your core slap you in the face and you sort of right in there it's like you have to respond to it and that what's the purpose why even bother yeah okay. and so to respond with meaning it's yeah it's, I think it's interesting how so many people have uh, really acknowledged this crisis, as they call it, the meaning crisis, um, and then us to see all of the different ways of responding or uh, uh, working it out has just been 
quite interesting. And I mean, even just to see the intellectual dark web, I'm not sure how strong of a movement that that is today as it was maybe a couple of years ago, but the figures that are involved are just so different, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like you have uh, the Weinsteins, right? So like materialistic, atheist, intellectuals, and then you have Verbeke, cognitive scientist, uh, but into the, what do they call it? The pneumatic or the, you can still have a spiritual experience mm-hmm. in your spiritual being, but not necessarily a religious commitment. And in, in fact, why not? Let's just make up a religion and see how it goes. Yeah. Same with yeah. rebel wisdom in that regard. Like you touched sure, on sure. But then you have like Paul Vanderclay, right? Christian reform pastor. Uh, and then Jonathan Peugeot, a, uh, a Orthodox Christian. So, <laughs> I mean, this kind of reminds me of the existential group. You know how you'd have like a Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky, but then in the same group, you'd have someone like Nietzsche, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, that's uh, it's an interesting cast of characters that are, you know, wrestling with uh, with these ideas right now. Um, you know, and it's, you can't, you know, you can't fix things without looking at, you know, I think sin, and what sin is and what the fall is. I mean, making a religion that's not a religion, you're taking upon yourself to build the world, to fix the world, right? You're taking upon mm-hmm. yourself cognitively to understand good and evil, which is just repeating the issue. Uh, you know, it's repeating the fall again. Um, so I think, you know, if you want to have a society where people treat each other better, why don't they treat each other well? What is that core of that? And I don't think intellectually coming up with schematics and, and, and you know, cognitive architecture that's very attractive to someone like me or you who's into this type of stuff. Well, how is that going to help someone that's maybe not interested in, in it intellectually? How is that going to help them, you know, um, find truth and meaning in a uh in a world of nihilism you know mm-hmm. vanderplay talks a lot about about you know that portion of it how are you going to do it with you know uh the homeless person and with uh you know yes. the harvard professor you know how do you bridge that gap uh-huh. um so yeah no no easy solution there but the uh the tensions are interesting to articulate i think yeah i think that's one of the things that impresses me most with christianity you touched on it just it, to the point where you know, how can you, well, I mean, the Christian claim is that truth is simple. You know, it can be, mm-hmm. it can be condensed to the form of saying, you know, God is love, you know, mm-hmm. love one another. And you can explain the most profound, I mean, the most meta complex structures of understanding through a, a, a heavenly story, excuse me, a heavenly principle with an earthly story through parable. Right to where even someone that's illiterate and simple-minded, they could understand. You know, they could connect and appropriate the the fullness of what it's meaning, even though they don't understand all of the technicalities or the the schematics, like you said. Sure. And so I think that that truly really will be the the challenge to Verbeke. We'll see how how he does with it. But Christianity. Uh, I used to think that it was, you know, religion that was protecting itself, like it was on guard. But as I've also read some of the church fathers from, you know, all the way back to, to you know, Athanasius, fourth century writer, and some authors also in the fifth century are going through David Bentley Hart's story of Christianity and just seeing that, you know, people are, they're trying to unfold and understand what is. Mm-hmm. I mean, there might be some aspect where they're just trying to maintain the religious structure and being dogmatic about, you know, what the fundamentals are. But by and large, Christianity is a religion that is crying out to God, trying to understand what is, not necessarily what they would like to believe it is. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, and, and um, you have to think about, Christ, right? I, and I was reading one of the, I forgot which one of the church fathers where he said, if, if you followed Christ to the, you know, like Christ, if you were like Christ, you wouldn't need religion. Like, you know, religion is mm-hmm. that which brings you back to the path. Um, if you could really, you know, follow, I mean, I'm reading the Sermon on the Mount now and trying to apprehend that he was bringing forth these ideas at the time that he was bringing them forth, like help others anonymously. Let's just do that. Imagine if we all did that, just helped others without taking credit for it. You know, pray without 
um, doing it in front of everybody, uh, you know, um, you know, help those that are, that are the worst off. I don't think it's just financially, like just this, his teachings. If we follow those things would, would, would work out the, the order would, would come into being, um, you know, and it, like you said, it's simple, but it's hard to continue to follow. Um, even personally, uh, you know, so it's, it's how do you, uh, got to keep wrestling with it and, and continue, I think, continue working on it, you know, working on yourself and, and, and following him, you know, for sure. It took oh. me a while from, you know, <laughs> even to th then come back to, you know, I, I got so not turned off, but when people talked about Jesus, I thought of people on TV or disingenuous people that would go to church, but would treat their spouses terribly and would, mm -hmm. you know, and I would judge, not judge them, but I would be like, I talked, I talked about this with my priest when I went to get back into the church and I'm talking with him and I said, you know, I just feel like, you know, people were you know, disingenuous. They go to church, but their lives are in shambles. And I realized, yeah, that, you know, that's why they go to church. And the church is like a spiritual hospital and it's, you know, me judging them. And so, yeah, you know, anyways, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot to, to wrestle with, with these ideas for sure. Well, James, let's uh, end the conversation, but keep on wrestling. So to yes, speak. keep on wrestling. Absolutely. <laughs> man. Thank you. I appreciate you reaching out and I really enjoyed this, um, you know, very much. Yeah. So the, just to leave our readers with a further reading. So the book we were talking about was Christ, the eternal Tao that mm -hmm. are you finished with your, your, what would you call it? The audio video reading of the book? Yeah. I, um, that is my second reading. I actually have the book here. I give you an idea what it looks like. Um, so that's what it looks like. I am on part three of the book, um, which is kind of my favorite part in the rereading of it, um, which connects a lot of these ideas that we're talking about. But I should be done in a few weeks with the rest of the book in terms of reading it out loud. Um, but feel free to, to link my channel. I don't have a lot of videos, but I've read this mostly this entire book so people can get an idea of kind of where we're coming from. Yeah, so it's kind of an exciting time. It's not too late to jump in, you know, yes. as the as the story is being read or as it's being told. Yes, uh, so are yeah. you? It, like I said, I've only gone about. I think I'm at the fifth video in, and you're starting to interject a couple comments here and there. Are you adding more of that? Or are you going to um, maybe do some lectures really. afterwards, or your thoughts? Yeah. I am actually, you know, I haven't been, I haven't been here and there as things kind of stood out to me, but not, not as much. I'm trying to just read it to, to kind of put it out there. Um, and as you'll see, the videos get better in quality over time. I've, I've changed my setting up here. So it's, it's a lot, you know, uh, better audio quality. Um, but I'm looking just to get that book out there um, so people can, can, you know, experience it and then can, you know, further research Father Sarah from Rose and look into his other works. But yeah, I definitely would like to start making some more videos and, and discussing some of the concepts and some of the concepts we, we talked about here. Um, and really, we didn't get into it uh, about symbolism and, and uh, you know, um, different ways on which to apply this symbolic framework to different things in, in practical life. That's something I'm interested in as well. So, oh, yeah, that would be, be a great conversation. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So. Uh, well, I want to leave you and some of the other listeners, too, with... Uh, Alistair Roberts has a, a, a series that he started at the end of last year on the gospel according uh, to Matthew. And he does about, I want to say like between 40 to 60 minute videos where he takes this whole long shelf of commentary and gets it down into a very manageable 40 minute lecture. And especially on the, the first chapter talking about the genealogy, but what you're just talking about with the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five, six, and seven, I thought were very helpful to what you brought up and what we're talking about today. Awesome. I will do. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. So I look forward to seeing you on the Symbolic World and the Zombie Apocalypse Facebook group and uh, right. having future, future conversations with you. Likewise. God bless. Thank you.